Michael. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we have now for you the uh, four panelists who are going to say a few words on kind of economic development from the perspective of the hat they wear in this community, the uh, organizations they represent. And each panelist will have kind of eight to ten minutes. And then we're going to basically open it up for questions and discussion. So you can ask any of the panelists any question that you think is appropriate. Uh, these are in no particular order except they're alphabetical. So we will be, begin with Frank Calzanetti. Uh, Dr. Calzanetti is Professor of Geography at the University of Toledo and also Vice President for Government Relations. This is a position he has held since July of 2011. Prior to this position, Dr. Calzanetti served as Vice President for Research and Economic Development at UT where he was responsible for the promotion of research and building the university's technology transfer and business incubation program. And Frank is going to talk about economic development in Northwest Ohio from the perspective of the University of Toledo. Thank you very much, um, Neil. And I'm really, uh, really thankful to be here. It's a very great opportunity, great turnout, and uh, Dan and Lee Fisher, I uh, really uh, enjoyed your presentation. And I did read the book, and I think that um, if you have an opportunity to read it, you'll see that it's pitched perfectly for the practitioners that Dr. Johnson talked about. Uh, I just wanted to say a few words, and perhaps if you read the book, some of these are going to be somewhat repetitive, about um, universities and economic development. Uh, if you look um, at global economies, and most of you are familiar with this, there is a, a trend toward moving from factor-based economies, toward efficiency-based economies, toward economies that are innovation-based. And you know this is like the thinking of the World Economic Forum, uh, where they, they talk about these different economies. And so we are in an innovation-based economy. And at an innovation-based economy, you're competing on the ability for you to uh, create new products and processes bring them into the marketplace, get a competitive edge. And this is grounded in higher education and K-12 education. Education is vital for these innovation-based economies. And so universities are at the forefront of this. And if you look around the world now at uh, advanced economies, you'll find that most universities have moved toward having economic development as an important part of their mission. Uh, and the University of Toledo is no exception. So uh, this is um, an additional um, uh, activity that we are involved with because we recognize the importance of universities to drive local economies. But let me, let me be very clear, is this is beyond a very narrow perspective of what universities provide. Sometimes we get locked into the idea that a university's contribution to economic development is a patent-centric model or linear model where uh, faculty members uh, do research. They have an invention. They uh, have an invention disclosure. They uh, take it to the tech transfer office uh, to, to protect it. To, you know, through patenting or intellectual property protection. And then they develop a company from this. That does happen, but that is a very uh, restricted view of the overall contributions that universities make uh, to their regional economies and to the general economy at large. Uh, so if you, if you look at uh, people who are trying to understand the university's contributions to economic development, a lot of the words that uh, Dan mentioned about collaboration, uh, the uh, interaction, give and flow, that is very central to what universities do. And so we, we must uh, just be careful about getting locked into this one view of this linear model of, of uh of ways that universities contribute to uh, economic development. If you look at most successful universities and their regions and the way they have had a role in transforming their regions, it's a very fluid, messy uh, system. You have the back and forth exchange of students and faculty, industry coming in and out, ideas coming in. Uh, students, are, they, they, they work in a, a laboratory on campus, then they go work in industry, then they come back and forth. 
this is how a lot of the technology transfer really occurs and uh, making a difference. Other contributions that universities make, just uh, you know this, uh, the pure economic impact. Uh, there's always these economic impact studies that uh, indicate what the total contribution of a university is to their regional economy, you know, just purchasing uh, how many people are on their payroll, things of that nature. Uh, attracting and building talent is much of what we are all about, and that's what is central to what universities do. We are trying to attract uh, talent for students and for our faculty and for our staff. Uh, we, of course, are in the knowledge generation business. We create knowledge. You know, it's a lot of what we're doing, creating knowledge and getting that knowledge out. Uh, we also are a good place to make connections to other communities in the region, uh, in the state, nationally and internationally. Our faculty members are connected in a lot of international uh, organizations, networks within their disciplines. And also the universities are also tied into federal agencies, state agencies. And so it is a great place to have those connections. And of course, universities are very important places venues to share information, bring people together, uh, exchange ideas, exchange people. And we do other things too, like business assistance, we have incubators, we have a tech transfer office. Uh, near, I could just go on down the list uh, forever. Uh, in Toledo, we're involved with helping the community in business attraction. Uh, entrepreneurship development uh, is very important to us. International engagement. Uh, so we contribute to the vitality of the community in many ways. And I didn't even touch on the events that we have, the sporting events we have. So it's, it's a very big contribution. Um, some people look at uh, the ways that universities can contribute through knowledge generation is uh, not to describe this as technology transfer, but more like knowledge valorization. You're trying to make the knowledge of value to society. And uh, one example of this is that we recently had a water crisis last summer. And um, you know, people were contacting uh, the university. Do we have experts over there? What, what type of expertise do we have? Can we have assistance? Well, it happens that the University of Toledo has very deep expertise around water. You know, uh, we have a lot of environmental scientists, environmental engineers. They're under the radar. They are very uh, much in the forefront in their disciplines. But they're not the typical people that are involved in tech transfer commercialization. So you don't see them. But what we have been able to do is to get that knowledge, bring it to the benefit of society uh, through our contributions um, uh, on, the, on the water um, issue that we had last summer. The, the University of Toledo um, has been involved with economic development for a long time. I think when Dr. Johnson came in 2001, we really ramped it up and stepped it up and became very active uh, with the other communities in our region, getting uh, well placed with uh, uh, the RGP and with the uh, Chamber and uh, with the Port Authority, working with other partners in the community. And we also, uh, uh, around 2000, started building up a plan to, to ramp up our research, build, build up our research base, which is really the foundation for new knowledge development. Uh, it's really put together a tech transfer office, an incubation program, uh, got more serious about entrepreneurship as well. So we have stepped up. And one recognition of this is that recently we were uh, designated by the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities as one of the uh, Innovation Economic Prosperity Universities, which is uh, an organization of all the um, uh, public universities. Uh, so OSU, the University of Michigan, uh, we're in it. So we are designated at that because of our our contributions that we made, and Marjorie Traban in the back was, you know, worked, you know, very hard on that, and and uh, and a lot of times we interviewed a lot of people in this room, going out, what are we doing as a university? And this was very important to do an honest assessment of of what the university was contributing to. We learned a lot. Uh, the university has very uh, strong support. And people in the community really feel strongly about the University of Toledo, and they want us to succeed. But one thing that was interesting, a number of people said that. We would like the University of Toledo to build up its academic strengths. We want to see the academic program strong too. Uh, so uh, that was something that uh, you know we came back and we we uh, over the last year or so really started focusing on strengthening the academic core of the university, paying attention to the academic programs, making sure that these programs were uh, were able to attract people from throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, we also um, 
you know, reassessed our contributions to uh, our region, and they're very significant. And right now I'm serving on, uh, as a reviewer on this program for the APLU, and I'm able to, to review proposals from Penn State, other universities around the country, and we're doing quite well. Uh, but the, the big difference is the scale of, of the University of Toledo compared to OSU and other universities. They're, they're much larger than than they than uh, we are, but we are doing a lot of very good things here at the University of Toledo. So um, uh, I'm seeing, um, I don't want to go on any longer, but I would just say that the university is very serious about maintaining its partnerships, building a stronger commitment. We're committed to our region. Uh, we have faculty members across our institution uh, that are doing exceptional work. Uh, but one thing we need to do is to make sure that these people have access to our community, do more to bring these experts to, to you and to the students. One thing I'll just end on is that I'm very concerned uh, about the reductions of state support for higher education, what it means for our economic development mission. Uh, the state of Ohio did have uh, some excellent programs to support university-based economic development. And uh, Mr. Fisher, I think, uh, is he still in the area right there? Uh, you're a big part of this. Uh, very important for building up our strengths. And uh, the third frontier in particular was one that was very, uh, very important. Uh, with the funding that's cutbacks that are going on right now, I'm very concerned about the ability for the university to continue to support our economic development activities uh, out of our uh, uh, funds that we have. So that's just a caution that I have that uh, I just wanted to share with all of you. So I think um, with that being said, me, I'll turn it back to you. Frank, thank you very much. Uh, the second panelist is the mayor of the city of Toledo. Uh, Paula Hicks Hudson became mayor in February 2015. Uh, prior to that, she was president of Toledo City Council. And while on council, she represented District 4. Uh, mayor Hicks Hudson was raised in Hamilton, Ohio, and has a master's degree in, communi in communications development from Colorado State University. Mayor. Good afternoon. I'm going to say less than 60 days ago, I was a district council person and was not the mayor of the city of Toledo. But that being said, as a district council person, one is able to do some things on a different le on a level very similar to a mayor. So I want to kind of start off my conversation with you talking about some of the things that I did as a district council person. Um, district 4, just, just so you know, is in the heart of the city. It is a, a diverse district in that there are manufacturing uh, entities in the district. There's legacy neighborhoods in the district. There is poverty in the district. There is crime in the district. And so it's a very challenging district, much as the city of Toledo is. But one of the things I learned was that in order to, to, and we talked about ways in which to build up and to bring about economic development within various areas within the city. Um, I also have downtown. And so you're going to hear some, and there's some successes about the downtown warehouse district, the uptown area of, this, of District 4. But some of those more challenging neighborhoods would have these commercial corridors that used to have, you know, shops, uh, bakery bakery shops, dry cleaning shops, uh, butcher shops, small grocery stores, and those have gone by the way of our big box industries. But one of the things that I learned from looking at the, um, the work and the activities within the warehouse district, the uptown district, is that there were these millennials, these young people who decided that they were going to take a, a risk and build and take over old buildings and without any real help from government, create a place, create a time and create a situation where, whereby they could live and grow. And so we have we have successes in the city of Toledo. And those successes, I think, come from that entrepreneurial spirit of individuals. So what does this, what can the city do? What can government do to help those individuals? And I think what we can do is, is three things. One, create a platform for entrepreneurs, create a partnership, 
and also create a place. And I think using District 4 as an example, I want to expand that, and we can expand it with the city of Toledo. In creating a platform, that means to me having an infrastructure that provides for the businesses to be attracted to areas. That means potholes as well as pools. And what I mean by that is that we have to take care of our traditional infrastructure, our roads, um, make sure that we have fire and police protection. But it also requires that we look at, at green spaces and recreational places. There's a lot of literature that shows the need for us to have places of recreation. And recreation is more than just pools. It is green space where people can have an opportunity to, to walk, to think, to get out of the concrete buildings that we live in and work in and have time to recreate and refresh themselves. One of the activities that I know that Joe's gonna talk about with Hensville is more than just a place to come for playing, I mean not playing, but watching sports, but also a place to, enter, to entertain oneself and to integrate oneself with a neighborhood and a place of, of great activity, which is the warehouse district. When we talk about partnership, it's partnership not with our traditional partners such as business or, or educational infrastructure, but it's also with labor. It's also partnerships with this, with these, these uh, the young and the restless as, as my friend Lee Fisher talks about. It's also making partnerships with suburban and urban areas so that we as a collectively can move together as a region to make sure that not one of us is left behind. When we talk about partnership, it is about not, not relying on those old stereotypes of what labor was or we think labor is, but really stretching out to see what labor is becoming. The city of Toledo is working with the building trades to, to work and working with the, the to, uh, Toledo Public Schools on ways in which we can create those technical Op educational opportunities for this workforce development. We've been talk we've had preliminary conversations with the county to make sure that we can expand on taking and keeping our young people here within our community because Toledo is a great place to live and to grow. I came here 32 years ago with my family and was told that I could do well in the city and I'm a living example that one can. When we talk about place, it's about collaboration, and it's those, and it's across jurisdictional lines. It's across community partners. It's looking at ways in which we can collaborate. One of the great things that I learned in Columbus when I worked with Governor Strickland in the Office of Budget and Management was this thing called shared services. I think we need to think of ways how we can share our services throughout this place called Northwest Ohio, city of Toledo. And that requires us to think differently and not to think that uh, the city of Toledo ends at this particular line and that Sylvania Township or the city of Sylvania uh, starts up or Maumee starts another place or that the state of Ohio ends at Michigan. We need to think of ways in which we can cross those lines and make sure that we all are able to grow collectively. I think that one of the things we're working on in the city of Toledo, since I've been there for less than 60 days, is how to look at internally how we as a city can better and best help these partners that I've talked about. And, and just some very simple things that we're doing, you know, making sure that when we take, uh, we enter to contract with contractors, that it doesn't take us three or four months to pay them, that we pay them in a timely fashion. We look at ways in which we can streamline our processes internally so that we can be cutting edge and leaders for others within the community to see that the public sector is just as innovative and just as forward thinking as the business sector or the labor sector or the educational sector or the nonprofit sector. I, I see my role as one of doing that. I'm going to end this in with my story about the, my time here with a story about the um, Junction Avenue. It is, for those of you who are from Toledo, in the day, Junction was a happening place. There were shops, there were um, 
people living there, working in this particular neighborhood. But with the changes with uh, urban renewal and other things, people moved out and it became a very kind of a depressed neighborhood. The neighbors will tell you that they're not depressed. The, the residents there who live there are, I want to call them like almost pioneers because they were thinking that when I first came on council, that they were not eligible or they should that they even should be expecting city services. Well, this group of folks decided that not only should they not only expect, but they began to organize and to work in ways in which to revitalize their neighborhood. They, is, they established partnerships with TEMACOG. They've, they've met with folks from the port. They've met with RGP. I don't think RGP, so not yet, but they're coming. But they, are, they have met with others to try to begin to revitalize their neighborhood. And working with the nonprofit sector, um, United Way has been very helpful in terms of them cleaning up their neighborhood. They know the numbers of various uh, departments within the city where they can get the streets clean, where the lights can be turned on, and all those things. And that's what we as government needs to do, is to, rec is to establish an opportunity, those lines of communication between our customers as well as our providers. And that's how I see my role and that's what the city of Toledo is about and hopefully we will continue along those lines. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Third panelist this afternoon is Joe Napoli. Uh, Joe is the president and general manager of both the Toledo Mud Hens and the Toledo Walleye. In this position, he's responsible for the strategic direction, goal setting, long-term planning, and business development for both of these Toledo professional sports franchises. Joe. Thanks. Um, I don't, is, the, uh, is the AV person out there? We have, um, we have some slides that can run. No. Okay. We have some renderings of Hensville that um, the whole idea behind the slides was to distract you from anything that I was saying. <laughs> so this is key. Um, it's on the uh, on the laptop, but I'll, I'll begin as the search begins for AV guy. Um, so Fifth Third Field, Huntington Center, uh, Hensville. How, how many of you feel like you've participated in the success? of those properties. Okay, I mean, just about every hand should go up. I, have, you, have you purchased a ticket? Have you been involved in any type of outing? Are you part of the financing and funding plans? Um, no, not that one. Um, there's another one that says Hensville, and, um, and it's a bunch of slides. You could, yep, that's it. And just hit the, um, it can scroll through. Just hit that, yeah, there you go. So, um, so what, did you all feel like you participated in some way, shape, or form? Yes? No? Yes. I'm yes. trying to wake you up there. Okay. So that goes back to some of the things that were covered in the previous discussions. You know, what, why do things become successful? Oh, thank you. Okay. So why did things become successful? Well, that's because you have the public-private cooperation, and people feel like they have a stake in the success, and they feel like they've contributed, and that they're part of it. So here are some of the lessons that we learned. Um, you take the warehouse district as an example. About 15 years ago, a handful of companies in the district, uh, virtually no payroll. So now we look at 15 years later, there's over 70 businesses, uh, Bars, restaurants, law firms, um, apartments, condos, um, furniture distributors, coffee shops. So a, a nice mix of a variety of different businesses, both retail and B2B. Um, virtually no payroll. Today it's about $12 million in payroll. So that's happened over the last 15 years with three years of a recession right in the middle of it. So why, why did that happen? Because we worked real hard on the funding, the financing, and the planning. Then what we did was we shared that story with the community, the public sector, the private sector, participated. And they, all, they both felt like they were participants and had key roles in getting that done. Very, um, very consistent with 
what we saw in the earlier presentations. So, so where do we go from here? You take a look at downtown Toledo, and then you take a look at Dayton, Louisville, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, um, Columbus. What do they have that we don't have? Anyone? Just, there are no wrong answers. Just say something. <laughs> people downtown. Okay, people downtown. What else? Leadership. Leadership, okay. Anything else? Okay, come on. Okay, someone's saying money. I'm sorry. Proud. Proud. Okay. Okay, pride. All right. What they have is a plan. And guess what? The plan survives the elected leadership and it survives the turnover in the private sector. So you go to those communities and I can tell you unequivocally they have a plan. And that plan is based on what do you think? Come on, you're a group of bunch of smart people. Research, what else? Public-private partnership. Public-private partnership. Anything else? Measurable goals, perhaps? Funding, financing plans, perhaps? I'm sorry? Leadership. Leadership, Leadership in the public and private sector. Um, yes, absolutely. Community also buys into their development plans. So what do you think happens as a result of that? Let's take Columbus, Ohio as an example. Um, 20 business leaders get together, the mayor's office, the county commissioners, they map out a plan that's a um, 10 year plan. They revisit it every three years. Um, metrics, goals are in place. And then what happens next? You start achieving the goals. Um, Politicians, raise your hand in the room. Okay, Tina, that's I'm you. Not a politician. <laughs> I'm a public elected, servant. elected officials and public servants. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so so here's what happens: you get the mic and you get the podium and you get to talk about all these wonderful successes. You know why? Pub, private sector doesn't care. <laughs> we just want the things to happen. So. The fact that you're a participant and you're making things happen and you're invested is, is a wonderful relationship. And everybody gets that, and that's what happens in these communities. So we're, we're on the same plan, uh, same guide path. Things begin to happen. The goals are reached. And then the CEO of Owens Corning moves on, or the CEO of ProMedica moves on, or I move on, or the elected official moves on. And guess what? The plan stays in place because the rest of the community has the buy-in, the private sector is bought in, and so is the public sector. So this is not hypothetical. This has happened in Louisville and Pittsburgh and Columbus and uh, all the other cities that, that Mr. Fisher alluded to as success stories. So w what is it that they have that we don't have? Come on. Uh, what? Right, we, okay, so good plan. But, but what do they have that we don't? Nothing. <laughs> they don't have anything that we don't have. Look at the people in this room. Are you all successful? Don't be, okay, see this is the New Yorker in me. So Midwesterners, you say, when you say, are you successful, you don't look at your notes. You say, what do you say? Yes, I am. Exactly, right. you say, yes, I am. New York, you put all kinds of curse words before and after it, and you say, of course I am. What a stupid question. <laughs> so you've got the Midwestern values that we all cherish, and the reason why I love it here is because of the humility and, the, and how humble people are. But you know what's so great about communities like ours? Um, you're wonderful people. Uh, you're not dealing with the arrogance of the two coasts. and and the two coasts when they make mistakes and they say, well, that's not my mistake, that's your mistake. <laughs> or um, the arrogance that just is pervasive in those cities, it drains you. And you don't have that in these communities and that's why they're successful. So we, we definitely have all the ingredients. What we do lack is a plan. What we do lack is, um, what, we, what we do not lack is what, what's fundamentally challenging for I think all of us, is we don't run out of excuses. And I, I don't quite understand that. So if I've heard it once, I've heard it a million times, 
Well, you know, we had the seven Fortune 500 companies. 30 years ago, you're killing me here. <laughs> Okay, we know that, we understand that, but you know what we have? We have a, we have a mid-sized market of incredibly successful businesses that are 50, 75, 100 million dollars a year. Totally under the radar, incredibly successful. We probably, with the mud hens and the walleye, we probably do business with um, 2,500 companies in the community. You know, I feel like a banker sometimes. Um, you know, you, you want to get a pulse of your community? Talk to your community banker. They know exactly what's going on. And when you talk to them and you talk to the, the regional banks and you talk to the community banks and they say, you know what, there's, there's a heartbeat in the community and it's, and it's strong. We, we just need to sit down cooperatively. We need, when I look at the people in this room, I don't see any egos here. So that's the beauty of it. None of us really care who gets the credit. Um, and we have to capitalize on that. We, we did. We did that with Huntington Center. We did that with Fifth Third Field. We're doing that with Hensville. And, and I know that because I'm living it, and I see the, the, the lack of egos, but I see the, 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 you know, that can-do attitude, the passion, um, the commitment. And, and you know what? Hensville is going to be very successful. And, and it's going to be successful because you're all participating in it and you're all contributing. And, and that's, fun, that's funding, financing, that, that's a whole nother story. We'll, we can share the brain damage related to the funding and financing. Anyone here dabble in new market or historic tax credits? <laughs> Just don't raise your hand because I hate you. <laughs> All right, so at the end of the day, it's gonna be great. It's probably gonna be between eight and nine million dollars that comes from the feds and the state with a purpose. That it's purposely dedicated to renovating 100 year old buildings in the urban core. And we're gonna be the recipient of those dollars. Uh, so Hugh Grief, Kim Kucher are two of the um, participants in that. And they've been very helpful. Um, the brain damage suffered from this program, we will be happy to save you a lot of pain and misery if um, as we move along and per, you know, perhaps um, there are other projects that you'll be able to participate in that can take advantage of these credits um, and we'd be happy to save you the, the pain and suffering that we've gone through. Um, so I'll end it there because I can go on forever. Um, I was told I was going to have like three hours, but <laughs> I guess I got 10 minutes, which thanks a lot. But um, <laughs> The, so I guess in a nutshell, we, we need a plan, we need support, uh, we need buy-in, uh, all the ingredients are there, it's crystal clear. Um, and then what we need to do with these other cities have done is they form these downtown development corporations and then they go hire two or three people that manage the plan very aggressively and their metrics, uh, their goals, and everyone buys into them. And even if, you know, here, here's the other part of it. Even if you don't agree with some of those metrics and some of those goals, when you leave that room, it's just sort of like a board meeting. You leave that room, you're all in agreement. Maybe you don't agree with everything that's going on, but when you leave and you depart, so when you're talking to the developers and that want to invest in your community, and you, you're talking to the folks that want to move into your downtown. So I, I'll give you an example there. Prometica comes to us and they say we want to develop the steam plant which is what 100 years old and um oh by the way there's a parking issue the same parking issue that came up 10 years before and then 10 years before that and then 10 years before that so for 30 years we've been reading about this parking issue as it relates to the steam plant so what do we do we run them through the ringer so what message does that send to the rest of the community? The biggest employer in town, uh, how many of you know Randy Ostra? Yeah, just about everybody in the room. How many of you think that, is there a more compassionate, thoughtful uh, leader in the community? Raise your hand if, I mean, he, he's one of that group, that elite group that gets it. So what do we do? We beat him up publicly. So if you're the small business owner that says, I want to move 20 people downtown, what happens? 
I'm not moving. I'm, I, I, I don't want to be publicly embarrassed. I don't want to be run through the ringer. Um, and I certainly don't want to be called names in the, in, in the letters to the editor. And I, I just don't need it. So what do I do? I make the easy decision. I stay in the suburbs. I buy a piece of vacant property and vacant land. And I build my business from my headquarters. Well, folks, we're just not in that position. Um, it, it's incredibly expensive to renovate the buildings in downtown. Paula uh, referred to the folks, the sweat equity in the warehouse district. Um, you know, uh, the, the one misconception with the warehouse district is it's not only millennials, it's folks that are the baby boomers, our age group, those 40, 40 50, 60, and believe it or not, 70 year olds that are saying, I also want to live in downtown Toledo and I don't want to cut the lawn anymore. And uh, my kids are, you know, out of the house and I want to walk to the fun stuff to do downtown because about a mil, actually it's uh, 2.3 million people come to downtown just for recreation. So uh, Fifth Third Field, Huntington Center, Valentine Theater, the library, Imagination Station, the art museum is only a, a mile from our front door. So in other communities, that's the Miracle Mile in Chicago. You walk that. Um, uh, the zoo is, I think, four miles from downtown. So you have this hub of activity. And again, we, we quite haven't capitalized on it. And the plan will take us there. And we'll connect all those dots. Next thing you know, you have this cohesive plan that everyone supports. And we look back uh, on this 10 years from now and we say, wow, what just happened? And, and I know I told you five minutes ago I was going to finish, but I got one more, one more comment. So you take ProMedica. ProMedica is going to eventually move downtown uh, and eventually uh, have 2,000 people downtown. So let's say 10% um, of them want to walk to work. Do we have the housing? Do we have the properties ready to go? That was a question. <laughs> okay, no. Okay. I say it depends. Okay. So if we had that downtown development corp that was proactive and understood that, what would they be doing right now? Yeah, they'd be talking to all of the developers that develop, you know, 100-year-old properties in downtowns all over the country and say, hey, come on down to Toledo because the mayor's office understands that developing a building that's 100 years old in your downtown is a lot different than developing a property in Sylvania, Perrysburg, Maumee, because the building codes for the suburbs don't match your downtown. So um, the folks at, at City of Toledo were fantastic. Um, uh, so so <laughs> it wasn't right away because but someone I helped, I know. <laughs> someone helped us. That was you. Mm -hmm. That was you help facilitate that process because we were banging our heads against the wall. And then the next thing you know, we've got that group of uh, mid-level managers and department heads at the city running through walls for us. Not only are they running through walls, they're counseling us. They're saying, hey, you know what? Um, you've got three buildings that don't meet the building code, but we can work with you on how to design the building in a safe manner so that people can get in and out of your building safely. Um, we're going to get the fire department involved, and we're going to make this an easy process for you. How many of you would be absolutely thrilled with a, a group that responds in that manner? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I, I'll tell you, we got special treatment because we're the mud hens and the walleye. I, I can also tell you that there are other developers that have invested in downtown and didn't feel the same way. Um, and that's a problem, and we got to fix that. So, but that's where the conversation starts, and we know that we have leadership that'll say that's not going to be a problem anymore because I'm going to fix it, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, you already said it before. Yeah. I mean, that's the way it works. So, so we can get it done. Is is the point? We just need we need to get moving because. I'm going to retire in about 15 years, and I want to look back, and I want to see that my kids 
are living in Toledo and they're enjoying Toledo and they're loving it. And um, my wife's from Toledo, I have no choice. Um, <laughs> but that's not actually true because I love it here. You, you, we've talked about that, you know, to, till the cows come home. There really are cows in Toledo, that's so cool. <laughs> um, so, um, the, um, so having said that, we've got this incredible quality of life. We've got all of these major league amenities in this minor league city uh, or mid-sized community. And um, we well, just got to get our act together and get it done. So thank you. Joe, thank you very much. Final <laughs> panelist is uh, Jeffrey Potter. Uh, Jeff is uh, president of Potter Technologies. He's chairman of the Potter Technology Group of Companies and CEO of the Breakthrough Humanitarian Relief Company, Sky Life Technology. He also, if you listen to Saturday Morning Radio, is the host of the very popular Business Blackboard on WSPD every Saturday morning. Jeff? Thank you, thank you. I want to first say that, Mr. Fisher, I don't know you personally, but that was outstanding. Uh, speech you gave. Now what I want you to do is give me the PowerPoint, take your name off it, put my name on it. That's the way things work at the Business Blackboard, okay? Uh, I really want to talk about the Warehouse District, but I came up here as the type of company that you would solicit to come to your town. And um, But my all my druthers including my frogs right here, want to talk what Joe talked about, but since you've already covered the subject matter, thank you very much. We'll talk a little bit about industrial development. Um, Mr. Brady knows this. Him and my dad worked at Owens, Illinois um, uh, 80, 80, 90 years ago. No. But uh, And I look back at that golden age of Toledo and and I think, how can we kind of recreate that here? And uh, Dan, you did such a great job. Where are you? Writing the book. I took it to Mexico City last week, um, slept with it. It was very nice. And it's a great book. And for those folks who have not read it, it's very conversational. Jeff, and Jeff that, that's just weird. Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> well, I, I'm sorry. I keep Toledo weird, okay? <laughs> I do my part. That's just weird. So... <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Johnson. Uh, I'll send my uh, condolences to uh, your wife. So uh, I have a couple of companies here. Uh, Potter Tech uh, develops, uh, you know, machinery systems that usually have an intellectual property type of uh, uh, part to them. Uh, that has a, it has uh, uh, led me to be the either the inventor or the lead facilitator on about 140 or 150 U.S. patents. Currently, we're working on a new technology called Skylife that's actually quite, uh, quite uh, impressive, which I'm going to quickly tell you how this relates to economic development. But the first thing I did is I wanted to start being part of the solution. So I met with my good friend, Ray Medlin, and uh, I said, hey, I have this great concept. And I go through it about all the cool stuff. We'll be like the diners and drive-ins and dives, but for business, right? You don't see the guy go into the restaurant and say, this place is crap. He goes into the restaurant and says, hey, look how they make this. Look how they make that. So that's what I wanted to do for business. So Ray and I got together, and uh, we, we pitched Andy Stewart over at Clear Channel at the time. And uh, they wanted a, like a $100,000 commitment from us to do, the, to do the program. And I said to Ray, I said, Ray, come on, man. I'll put in 50. You put in 50. He says, JP, I'm with you through thick. I said, what about thin? He said, no, you come up with the 100 grand. So that's how we launched the show. And now the show is so popular that I sat down with the uh, iHeart Media director, uh, Kelly Holman. She said those numbers on Saturday morning are the best numbers they've ever had. And, and why do people listen to it? Because we're talking, we're talking about all the good things in Toledo. That's it. And we don't want to talk about the bad things. So... When we launched Skylife, I thought, well, where should we be located? And we keep asking ourselves, you know, why not San Antonio? 
why Toledo? And it's a very good question. And we have board members from D.C. all the way out west to Phoenix, and they ask us the same question all the time. Why are you in Toledo? Of course, I'm born here. The first um, uh, uh, congressperson from Toledo was a gentleman by the name of Emery Potter. And my father's father was born here, my grandfather, in the 1880s. So I want to see Toledo very successful. And, and the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to build an empire. So Sky Life has developed this new innovative technology for humanitarian aid. Currently, I have people in Austin, Texas, <laughs> Dallas, Texas, Tampa, Florida, Nairobi, Sudan, Dubai, and now in Mexico. And uh, do we have the AV person um, here? Oh. No, I'm not, but Well, can you get on the internet? <laughs> oh boy. We have a stack of issued and patent pending intellectual property. Go, so can you go to www. Skylifetech.com. And then if you could scroll down to where it says view Skylife video, I just want to show you what we're taking around the world in all those places right as we speak. Skylife invented an efficient aerial mass distribution micro delivery system. The packs are loaded into specialized pack boxes and lightweight Skylife Gaylord standard-sized shipping containers using new lightweight pallets. Skylife's boxes and Gaylords use innovative parachute deployment systems. They flip open when dropped. Aerodynamic packs float safely to the surface with payloads of water, food, shelter, hygiene, medicine, and even emergency communications devices. Disaster victims gather up packs and use their life-sustaining contents immediately. Saving lives, alleviating misery, delivering hope. Sky Life Systems. Assured, affordable, fast, are the new standard of care in disaster relief. You know, Marcy said that her goal when Marcy Kaptur gave a speech on Sky Life, she said, you know, Jeep was so important to Toledo. She says, I want Sky Life viewed just like Jeep is viewed someday. And we hope so too. But we're small now. We're a pre-revenue startup. We're actually negotiating our first contracts with the World Food Program um, in Africa right now. We did our first live drop on Monday in the refugee camp of Eldoret, Kenya. And the everything's gone incredibly uh, fantastic. But so we're, we have some space that we've leased out at the airport where we have four manufacturing lines. We're going to need another 12 manufacturing lines. We'll probably outgrow that facility within a year. We probably need something closer to 500 to 800,000 square feet. We'll probably have several hundred employees working for us. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, <clears throat> which my board will ask me is, are you sure you're located in the right place to do business? Is Toledo really the perfect place? You know, what's wrong with Geneva, or what's wrong with uh, some place closer to, um, you know, whatever? And the neat thing is, it's made us, con uh, it's actually made us redesign our product so we can ship out of Toledo, very, very cost effectively. But one of the things I want to remark about the warehouse district, we bring in dignitaries, everybody from consulates to uh, government officials. We have people in from London, from Europe, from Geneva, from Brussels, uh, Mexico. Uh, and I have to tell you, the first place we go is downtown for dinner. It, it could be anywhere. We either take them to Rockwell's, then we go to one of the restaurants around the Mud Hens there. But everybody says the same thing to us. What a neat place. Boy, I wish we had this back where I live. And, you know, we all kind of look at them and go, hmm, 
Um, okay, that's good. So like, we must be doing some things uh, right here. And so you, what we have to do as a community is we have to look at the next sky life, even sky life now, but, or the next big thing that comes along. Or the company, and I know who you're talking about, that maybe didn't get special treatment. We have to look at how do you land these guys? How do you land a Sky Life or a PTI? You know, how do you how do you get them here? And Dan, your book is really on target. I can tell you the first thing we look for is the young talent has to actually be talented. When we built a nanofiber line last year, it's the world's fastest nanofiber laydown chamber. Um, I have to tell you, they do not have very good tool and die shops in Texas. And we brought some of their technology up to Toledo, completely redesigned it, and had it made. And the, the company was just like, they said, well, where did you get that made? I said, I don't know, one of 190 uh, tool and die shops between Detroit and Toledo and Cleveland? You pick one. Uh, tell me what the tolerances are. And and they're just amazed by our infrastructure here. So the first thing that you'd have to do is make sure that you know the, the you talk about your book that the fit is there. The same way with Skylife, we had to go around the globe and say, I know you don't do this now. I know you do it other ways. This is going to bolt onto the front of how you do it now. How do we fit? Well, and we have to say, well, gee, I don't know how you fit. But that's what you guys have to do at the RGP. That's what. All the uh, elected officials have to do, they have to grab a Skylife or a myriad of other companies and say, okay, what is your pain? What's the problem? Well, I'll tell you what my pain is. i got to ship this stuff all over the world, and it's price sensitive. And we're dealing with governmental and donor money. So, you know, our people can't <laughs> show any signs of excess or any type of, um, um, you know, inefficiencies. So one of the ways we've been working with... Uh, the Special Operations Command, SOCOM, uh, out of uh, Tampa, is we've developed a, a several products that go inside the Skylife pack directly for the U.S. military, for their Special Forces uh, operations. And the, the, way, the reason that we ended up doing it the way we did it is because we could actually do it in Toledo cheaper, less expensive, than we could do it in China. And one of them involves an electronic audio card. So... I have my own theories on economic development, which I'm sure you're all dying to hear, and then I'll end this. Number one, I mentioned, uh, I keep, my, keep, uh, my whistle keeps drying. Yeah, I talked to you a little bit about the Potter history, but we need to celebrate our provenance. The world has changed on us. We went from a society dying for homogenization in the 60s and 70s. Now, when I go to a city and I travel every week, I eat in the nicest restaurants, I go to the nicest places. Why do I do that? Because I want to know what that city is like. I would never, if you guys catch me, then I, uh, I, I, but I will never eat in a chain restaurant unless you force me. I would never. There's no way I would eat in a chain restaurant Unless, of course, it's some sort of form of Gallagher's in Princeton, New Jersey or something that's a, a sister one. But we need to celebrate the, the great history of Toledo. I remember a few years ago, my wife was ill in the hospital. I have six kids, so I round them all up in the car. We drive out the Fallen Timbers. And I said, you guys know what the Battle of Fallen Timbers was? No. I said, well, I practically don't either, so let's go check it out. So we park at the park, and we go down. We get bitten up by mosquitoes, even though it's noon now. And uh, we read the story of Turkey Foot. He was the uh, guy on the other side of the, the battle, and he was the leader. And, of course, our guy was Anthony Wayne. So, obviously, you know why we don't call it the Turkey Foot Bridge, right? We won. So, <laughs> but the point is, we need to celebrate that stuff. The second thing we need to do, and trust me, I, I've been the recipient of many uh, innuendo and passing by... We need to have the appetite for failure. We simply have to be able to fail and not get ridiculed and tortured publicly. You know, I can tell you my experience. I go on for 10 years, but the point is you have to be able to fail. And because you fail doesn't mean the guy's an idiot or a loser or the lady's got in over her head. It doesn't mean any of that. That means you rolled the dice and it didn't work. Man up, hop back on the horse and move on.
You know, that's what I've done, and we've got a heck of a heck of a great story to tell. I think the thing that you touched on, or uh, Frank touched on here, is funding. And you you talk about it in your book, a whole chapter. Boy, I'll tell you, just having access to capital is what a lot of people go to California for. They just go there. There's a myriad of opportunities there. I think the last thing that I want to leave you with is I hope Sky Life's in a position to do this someday, but um, we have to build our icons. We have to build our temples in the sky. We have to make sure that young... I remember the first time I saw a limousine, we did not grow up... Uh, we grew up in Sylvania Township, but not, um, not that Sylvania Township, okay? <laughs> My dad also had six kids. And, uh, but I remember the first time I saw a limousine, I go, I'm going to be rich when I get older. And I'm going to buy a limousine. Then I didn't realize you'd be driving your own limousine, so that didn't really make a lot of sense. But, uh, but I want that little kid in the inner city to look up at our new icons and look at the, the Huntington Center and what it's become, or the Mud Hens, or things like that. Things like that and say, wow, this place is on fire. And I'll leave you with what I tell my employees when I, we hire them and we have these little workshop sessions about like this. Here's my job as CEO. I'm firm, but I'm fair, and I am firm. But I am going to let you fly as far and high as your God-given talents will take you. And that's what I want for uh, Toledo. Thank you. Jeff, thank you. Uh, we are running behind time, uh, but we do want to give you the opportunity to ask the panelists some questions and we will have the kind of networking reception afterwards so you can uh, communicate with them there so if you have a question raise your hand and we have a microphone here which we will pass to you Are there other cities, cities competing for your business right now for, for in terms of location? I um, came here this afternoon anticipating being educated and informed, and thanks to Lee Fairshear and people like Dan Johnson, uh, we were able to do that. Uh, we were certainly entertained by some of the people on our panel because I think we learned some things. Uh, Jeff, you did a wonderful job of entertaining us, but you also informed us about things that many people don't know about your product. Joe Napoli gave us some vision about what's going to happen with Hensville, and he pointed out to us that even as a local guy, even as somebody as dear and near as the mud hens and the, the, the walleye, they had to run the gauntlet to do what they wanted to do downtown. Mayor, there are people coming to this community from outside this town, and if they have to run the gauntlet that Prometica has to run and Napoli had to run, those people are going to run. They're not going to make the commitment down here. So it's going to be very important to you and the leadership in the city that we not only attract these people, but we keep them. And then lastly, I'd like to talk about two underutilized assets in our community. One is the airport, and the other one is Dan Johnson. And they have a connection, and it has to do with logistics. What's happened in Toledo has happened very subtle. We haven't had a lot of press on it. But in the past, logistically, and Dee Monsky knows this, most of the major warehousing and distribution centers went to Finley because they were a more pro-development community, not because they had better assets. We have the better assets. We have the turnpike. We have the interstate. But we really haven't been able to get in the game. Recently, in a joint economic development zone with the city of Toledo, which most people don't realize, <coughs> out in Troy, which is out by Metcalf, the largest distribution center in the network of Home Depot is soon to be completed. It's almost 2 million square feet. It's the largest a fulfillment center in their network. That's going to put us on the map. And it's going to be important for all of us. This is my last comment. We talk about regional cooperation. Dan Johnson talks about it. I live it every day. 
if we don't get our act together, if we don't learn to work together as a region, and we have more motivation than ever before, because in the past, it was Toledo against the suburbs. That was the mindset that existed probably when Donna Owens was mayor. Now, Toledo's best assets happens to be the land in the joint economic development zones that they have in the outlying areas. There's no better time, there's no greater reason demonstrated by Home Depot why we shouldn't, as the new mayor, reach out to our neighbors and find out how we can work together as a region. End of comment. Sure, absolutely, please. I couldn't agree with you more because that's one of the things that we have, you know, we not just coming into the office of mayor, but but working with the members of city council and knowing that we have to work together as a region. And how we do it, it's, you know, it's going to take some time. And I think the most important thing it, it is, is about communications. Because I think what Lee talked about was creating trust. And, and that's one of, the, one of the things I've done as part of being um, in this office very recently is to reach out uh, to the member, and I hate to use that term, but to, to make appointments and to try to meet with the different partners throughout the city, throughout the county, throughout the region. And, and begin to talk about ways in which we can, I use the term shared services, how we can share that our services, share our vision, because it is really important that we think in those terms. What you're talking about in terms of the, the red tape and the, and the barriers that many um, companies have had to face, starting really under uh, Mayor Bell, moving under Mayor Collins, and I intend to continue that, is ways in which we can streamline our processes so that we can make it easier for businesses to operate. Some of the, some of the negatives that came about from the ProMedica was because I don't know if we really communicated that project very well. And that was one of the, my criticisms um, was that it wasn't quite done yet. So when it, it came out in pieces, so as it, instead of it coming out in whole cloth, um, and I do think that as we continue to move forward under this administration, whether it's up until November or whether it's for two years, that we will continue to work on that because it is critical. It is absolutely critical that we work together. So that's one of my pledges as I sit in the seat and as I move forward with it. And I know that members of council are in agreement with me as well. Uh, Sandy Spang is here um, as from council and we've had conversations not only for the big companies, but also for those neighborhood smaller companies because those two help in the development of this area. And I don't mean just the city, I mean the entire region. So I just wanted to respond because I think it's important that you know that it's, an, it's a new day, but we also have to let go of what, what has been happening in the past as well, and let's all work together to move forward. Thank you. Uh, I've just been overwhelmed uh, today, frankly. Uh, there are so many people to thank here. Uh, Lee, first of all, thank you very much for really being the centerpiece of this afternoon. What a great uh, talk it was. Uh, I need to thank Barbara, uh, again, Barbara, uh, the UT Press, and uh, Neil Reed, the uh, Urban Affairs Center, sponsored this event today. We hope it's part of an ongoing conversation in Toledo around really important things. Our panelists were terrific. Joe, thank you very much, Mayor. We are so grateful for you taking time today to talk to us. Frank Calzanetti, my friend and He's in the trenches, in the arena, whatever the metaphor is, he's there. Frank, thank you very much. And Jeffrey Potter, thank you. I've developed a friendship with Jeffrey, and I keep learning more and more about economic development from a private sector perspective. And Jeffrey, I thank you for that. Thank all of you for being here. We have a, a reception. We've ordered a lot of wine and a lot of beer, so I hope you will help us consume that. Uh, and uh, it's just down the hall in the faculty lounge. Uh, and uh, uh, please take a few minutes uh, uh, when you're there and uh, network, uh, speak with uh, any of our panelists or speakers today. 
And uh, would you uh, join me in giving a round of applause to all of our panelists and the participants today. Thank you very much. Uh, we are adjourned uh, to the faculty lounge, and I hope you can join us there for a little while while we uh, wind down from today. Thank you very much.